Hello and welcome to Red Carpet of Hollywood. I'm your host, Marina Kufa. And today we have the honor of sitting down with a retired Chicago police officer and esteemed author, Dr. James B. Bolan. In this interview, we will delve into a compelling insights of his groundbreaking book, Fixing This Broken Thing, The American Criminal Justice System. Join us as we explore Dr. Boland's unique perspective, rooted in over two decades of experience within the intricate threats of the criminal justice system and uncover his passionate call to action to reform. Without further ado, let's jump into this critical conversation with, our, with Dr. James B. Boland. Uh, what solutions uh, can you offer alongside critiques of the criminal justice system uh, could you provide example of a flaw you identify and um, the corresponding solution you propose? Okay. Well, one of the things that just jumped right off the page, at least for me, uh, mm -hmm. in addition to being a uh, retired Chicago police, I'm a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. And I would say this, that the 12 weeks of training I got in old school Marine Corps boot camp better prepared me for policing than six months in the police academy. So one of the things that I would want to immediately uh, upgrade is the selection and training process for police officers. Uh, the thing that I gleaned from uh, old school Marine Corps boot camp mm -hmm. that I found just invaluable for policing was the ability to suppress the emotion and make rational decisions. I that see. became critically important. And I found out that's not, not just for policing, but for life in general, because it's been my mm -hmm. experience that Emotional decisions generally tend to come back and bite you in the butt. Right. Marine Corps boot camp did a very good job of that because we were, uh, it was just pounded into us that we had to suppress the emotion because emotional in an emotional dis, uh, decision, you have tunnel vision. And to effectively do your job, you need a panoramic view. So you're making rational decisions. Uh, to become a recruit and just in any uh, police department in this country, one of the things that you have to do is take this, they call it a psychological test. It's a uh, multiple choice. You know, it's a multiple choice uh, uh, test and there's over like 300 questions. Basically, it's about 80 questions that they ask you two or three different ways. And from this, they purport being able to glean some sort of access to the candidate's uh, character. Mm -hmm. uh, myself, I thought all it was was just uh, a test as to whether or not you can recognize redundancy. Contrast that with old school Marine Corps boot camp. What's mm -hmm. done there is that the candidate is put in stressful, consistently put in stressful situations for three months because yes. the Marine Corps knew that under stress, your character will surface. Or as senior drill instructor Gunnery Sergeant Stein told us, we're going to know about you, boy. <laughs> oh, and <my>. definitely. <laughs> That's what it was. Well, and Marine boot camp is one of the hardest one, right? The old school Marine trainings. Corps boot camp yeah. uh, was very challenging, very challenging. But because it fit with the uh, the tagline at the time, they say we're talking about the Marine Corps, say the few, mm -hmm. the proud, because it, it was a weeding out process. Because they would let you know when you first got there. That I'll never get this. Stand on those yellow footprints at one o'clock in the morning. And one of the first things you hear is a, a man will tell you, look to your left, look to your right. One of you will not be here at the end of these 12 weeks. And we will do everything fair and unfair to determine whether or not you packed a gear to serve in my beloved core. Mm -hmm. uh, how that translated was being a Marine, 
is an awesome responsibility. We need to know if you have shoulders broad enough to bear the burden of, of that responsibility. So later in my career, when I became a police, uh, I was a police officer and I became a field training officer as I uh, dealt with each of my recruits. And I think this should also be a point of emphasis in all police training is that, you know, each agency will call its badge something differently. In Chicago, we refer to it as a star. And I point out to my recruits that that star on your chest does not represent power. The power is in the law. The star represents an awesome responsibility. Mm -hmm. I need to know if this is something you can handle. So at the end of our four weeks, if I come to the conclusion that you can handle this responsibility, I will pass you. If I come to the conclusion that you can't, I will either recommend you for further training or termination. Not everyone should be a police officer. And the police, police academy training select should not be a babysitting process. Right. We babysit you through because the overall goal is we had to get through this mandatory six months so we can get you out and into those squad cars. No, that yeah. is that just harken back to that Marine Corps tagline, the few, mm -hmm. the proud. Now, I know the municipalities will, oh, well, well, gee, if we spend so much money on the recruiting and the training and, and that sort of thing, I understand that. But in the book, I quote, uh, illustrate an article from the Wall Street Journal that uh, it uh, reported on the hundreds of millions of dollars municipalities are having to pay for issues of police misconduct. Some like, okay, pay me now or pay me later. And when you pay me later, you'll pay me more. They, they, we, they, they do a very good job of growing you up. Right. <laughs> I wish we as a parents could do it, right? So um, were you able to bring those skills that you um, that you had in the Marine Corps and, and kind of reapply to the police officers when you were a field oh, I, trainer? I, oh, I, that's exactly that's exactly what I did. That's that's exactly how I approached it. And um each of the recruits, well, with the with one exception, uh, each of the recruits that I trained uh, at the conclusion tell me how much they appreciated the way that uh, I handled this, that they had learned quite a bit. Because, you know, because from the very beginning, unlike, well, I, one of the things I did from the very beginning that a lot of other guy, uh, uh, field training officers did not do is I handed the key to the squad car to the recruit. I see. <laughs> You're going to drive. And they're like, yeah, you're, you're going to drive. I already know how the police drive. You're not going to learn that by watching me. And for those that were not familiar, uh, they, maybe they weren't familiar with that area of the city, I said, that's no problem. I'll tell you where to turn. <laughs> you have a driver's license. <laughs> were they nervous? Some, oh, sure. some were, but then there were a couple that were like, they embraced Excited. it. They were like, yeah, they, they, they liked that. They said, mm -hmm. oh, okay. Right. Because right now well, I'm going to treat you like you're my partner, not my recruit, unless you start acting like mm -hmm. a recruit. Makes sense. They were given okay. the responsibility right there. <laughs> it, because that's what this is. This is a uh, responsibility. Mm -hmm. Because again, as I state, uh, previously stated, the power is in the law. Right. So everything should start with the training, and the training should be right, just like the military training. Ex ex because it there's be, a major it, deficiency in the police be training. It right? should be because I've, I've seen where I, I know, like in my uh, uh, my former department, they've already dumbed some things down. That one of the uh, challenges that uh, people had to uh, in the physical in the uh, physical fitness part uh, mm -hmm. in the academy to graduate from the academy. Once there was a six foot wall, and to get a, to make it through the training, you had to demonstrate you could get over this six foot wall. Well, some recruit filed uh, a suit saying, "Okay, I can't make it over that wall. That should not exclude me." And uh, some misguided court said, "Yeah, okay, we agree with you." And so now that's no longer a requirement. And I, I'm like, 
why are we dumbing it down? Mm -hmm. that, that, that doesn't make sense because this should be that challenging because, uh, the, again, this is an exceptionally responsible job. I also, uh, in, in the, so as uh, a member of the Marine Corps, while I was in, um, everybody in the Marine Corps from private up to including the commandant had to take a physical fitness test every three months. Yes. Uh, now, there are some police agencies that require that uh, the candidates, uh, the officers continue to take these physical fitness tests afterward, but there's many that don't. So uh, I believe in this, uh, I, I strongly adhere to this adage that, that appearance commands respect. So when the citizen calls the police and somebody shows up to uh, uh, give this citizen um, assistance, if this person jumps out the car looking like Humpty Dumpty, how much in, how much confidence does that inspire in you, the person that's been victimized, as opposed to a well-fit individual that should say, okay, well, this person maybe can help me, but Humpty Dumpty over there, I'm not sure. Uh, that we also have, like the former mayor of the city of Chicago, uh, had issued an edict that the police thought that police could no longer engage in foot pursuit. And um, I don't get that because if you call the police and I show up and you tell me about this wrong, this crime that has been committed against you, and there's the person responsible. And I tell you, according to mayor, I can't chase this person. This makes you feel what way? Like nobody I, cares. I, right? Yeah, I, 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 the, I, I don't get that. See, you know, because during the course of my career, uh, I maintained the fitness. I ran twenty miles a week. Mm -hmm. So everybody I chased, I caught. It didn't have anything. <laughs> to do. It had nothing to do with speed. They got tired. I did. Yeah. And wonderful thing about uh, uh, engaging in the long foot pursuit, when you do catch that person, there's not that much difficulty in handcuffing them because they're too pooped to pop. Yeah. <laughs> they are wiped out already. <laughs> right, they're done. So, okay. <laughs> I think you, that you owe it to uh, the citizens that you're supposed to be serving. You owe it to them to be physically able to go, to take care of this situation. We had to take, pass a physical fitness test to get admitted to the academy. You had to pass a physical fitness test to graduate from the academy. And so I do believe that that should be the standard throughout your career, that you should maintain that level of fitness so that you can, uh, you, you can work the job the way it should be worked. And the other thing too, uh, it helps you because at the end of the career, when you retire, now you're in good enough health to enjoy the fruits of your labor. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I saw a video uh, recently. You know, I guess it was on social media and uh, it's, it's something completely uh, different. You know, the police officer pulled up, I guess, was uh, a guy sitting in a car. And they ask him, uh, can, well, you know, what's going on? Are you okay? Well, what can we do for you? And the guy said, uh, I could use a hug. And he broke down in tears. So I see there is also um, a lot of emotional involvement. And and you, you have to be able to judge the situations. There, there's so much psychological uh, work into every situation that police officer have to do. I don't think people really realize it, you know? No, that's because one of the things about doing that job is that you are consistently looking at the underbelly of life. Uh, people don't call the police because they want, hey, come on over, have uh, have some lemonade with me. They, they called you because something not so good has happened where there's concern. So uh, the empathy has to be there. If you don't have the empathy, then this is not really the profession for you. That means you're a bad person. This just this just doesn't fit for you. 
Right. Well, cause yeah. you have to, you have to have that empathy. Cause one of the things I think that helped me throughout the, my career, again, making rational as opposed to emotional decisions, I was able to a lot of times talk people down. There were a lot of fights that I did not have to have because I talked the person into the handcuffs. Are you able to like de-escalate them? Yeah, I was, I was able to talk them into the handcuffs. Now there's those knuckleheads out there that, okay, regardless, <laughs> So had to oh, be prepared. To, you had to be prepared for, for that. Uh, the other thing that just, as far as the media is concerned, I wish that we could just eviscerate this one term because it's an oxymoron. Routine traffic stop. That does not mm -hmm. exist. Statistically speaking, more police officers are injured or killed during traffic stops than any other police function. So there's no such thing as a routine traffic stop. I see. That is a very, very and we spend in, in uh, academy training, we spend hours watching video of police officers seriously injured or killed mm -hmm. during a traffic stop. What I think what spoils uh, uh, the public is uh, really good television dramas like Law and Order. It's a good TV TV drama because in Law and Order, if you get arrested for a felony and you get arraigned the next day, three weeks later you're in trial. In the real world, when you get arrested for this felony, sure you can get arraigned the next day. But you, if you decide that you want a trial, that trial is going to transpire in about 18 months to two years. Uh, that's what I was going to say, like a one year, probably. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 18 months to two years later, then we'll have the trial. Mm -hmm. Not like in, in law and order, the uh, assistant state's attorneys get to go out onto the street and do some of their own investigation. Uh, not in the real world. If you walk into yes. just about any uh, 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 criminal court in the country, Court starts at nine. You get there by the quarter to nine, and you'll see the uh, assistant state's attorney come in with a cart. And on that cart, there's going to be about thirty files. The public defender will come in, cart thirty files. That's the morning call. Oh my gosh! Then they'll go through. Right, they'll go through the morning call. We'll break for lunch. You come back uh, after lunch. They come back into the courtroom with the same cart and thirty different files. That's the reality of our criminal justice system. Well, that's, yeah, right. that's a lot. Yeah. Especially in a, in, in a huge city like Chicago. You know, it's that, 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 New that, York, that, that, right? That, yeah. <laughs> Probably doubles that, and triples, yeah. So uh, I discussed you, that in the book. I discussed the fact that uh, I, I came uh, in our supposed to be adversarial system that uh, essentially what this is is a contest. And so the heck with the truth. It's, you know, who we're, the goal is for the attorneys is to win the contest. And they want to win regardless of the truth, regardless of right and wrong, but win. So earlier when I was talking about uh, the uh, felony review, and the fact that there are some cases that even though all the facts are there, that the, and the, 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 this crime did occur, what they're judging 
is whether or not we can win this contest when it gets to court. Because to maintain their yeah, so but because to maintain their job, they have, have to have like a 90 percent conviction rate. I had another case mm-hmm. where I arrested a man for strong armed robbery. He uh, jumped his senior citizen uh, at the, got the uh, he got his check at the first of the month. Took it to the currency exchange, cashed his check. Coming out of the currency exchange, this guy jumps him in the alley, beats him up, and takes his money. So we catch the guy, lock him up, and uh, a year later, when we get ready to go go to trial, uh, and my victim is there, he's an older man, he's not really well educated. I don't know if he even made it out of grammar school, uh, because I think he was initially from the South, and it worked on the farms, and then later he moved north, but he's a senior citizen. So after the pretrial interview, the prosecutor approached me and told me that I was lucky that she wasn't in felony review that night because she would not have approved these charges because the man doesn't speak really well. Oh, okay. not because the not because the oh, facts yeah. are not there, but he doesn't speak well, and I have to put him on the stand. So the fact that it doesn't speak well, does that make him any less a victim? Mm-hmm. And she was like, no, but I, I don't even know if I can win this because he doesn't speak well enough. I said, well, concentrate on uh, what you do of painting your picture when you put me on the stand. I'm sure that I speak well enough. Was he English speaking or was he? Oh, yes. He was, yes. Okay. He was English speaking. He was English speaking again, but the, uh, again, he just wasn't really well educated. Mm-hmm. I see. I see. I thought but that maybe this, he had some kind of disability or something. No, but, he yeah. was just—he just wasn't really well educated. I see. Uh, see, because I—I I, I, like, for example, I knew of a gentleman once that uh, he was a brick mason, and he didn't speak real well either. Couldn't read that well. But if you put a blueprint in front of him, he could build anything you wanted to have built. So, yes, he he couldn't do that really well, but he could uh, execute his trade really well. I really believe that what our court system should be is a fact-finding exercise in pursuit of the truth. Because if we've not uncovered the truth, how on earth can we attain justice? How do you envision your book sparking a national dialogue on criminal justice reform and how people can participate, um, you know, once they read the book, how, I guess, all the plan is laid out in the book? Well, the first thing is that uh, the book, one of the things the book for which the book calls is moving people out of your comfort zone. Because in general, we can settle into, uh, you know, a state of comfort. And even though there's some things that we know that could be better, but but right here in my lifeboat, uh, things are sort of comfortable. And to, uh, to improve, you have to get uncomfortable. And then you also have to challenge persons that are in these positions of responsibility to also move out of their comfort zone because they've been doing this this way for so long and there's they've settled into this they you know okay this is i could i'm going to do this and keep doing it that way and uh just put my head down and keep working and until i get to retirement and you know and that be yeah. that Regardless of the fact that there are people that, that are not being served as well as this system should should be, as the system should serve them. So uh, to provoke a, inclusive in the book, uh, I have proposed uh, that their curricula be uh, put together, developed, mandatory curricula for grades one through 12 in conflict resolution. Because mm-hmm. uh, I believe that intrinsic to that sort of training, we will be teaching, honing the skill of critical thinking. 
something yes. for which I believe our world is sorely in need. Yeah, right. <laughs> <Critical> <laughs> There's a lack of other education yeah. right now in the school, but right. the critical, critical thinking th is missing. Right, critical thinking skills. Because we should be able uh, uh, to think for self as opposed to uh, being to being directed, told this is what it is and and don't question. Uh, I, I just harken back to say, my own school experience. Uh, I was in first grade. And we're in for, I, I, this, I, this stood out for me. I was in first grade and we were being taught about Christopher Columbus. You know, Christopher Columbus discovered America, right. et cetera. And then the instructor went on to tell us about the Indians. Now, see, I had a different idea about discover. I thought discover meant this, if you discovered something, no one else knew it existed. So the instructor was telling us about the Indians. I raised my hand and asked, how is it possible that he discovered something that people were living there already? Right. It was a common sense question. Right. And so yeah. the response was, response was I got smacked upside the head and told be you know be quiet be quiet yeah mm -hmm. but this you know so so really were we being educated or indoctrinated yes I agree <laughs> yes yeah so again Especially you know those critical days. thinking skills and I, so that we could we can question some of the things that were being uh, that's being presented to us and say no that doesn't make sense. That, that, that doesn't make, what are you hiding? Right. Or what's your real goal for show, for presenting this material? What is your real goal? What is it to try? What are we what are we doing here? And so I believe that if we do this, then we have a populace that's uh capable of handling a lot of the things that I suggest in this book. Because I did get um I got a telephone call from a judge, retired judge in Mississippi that had read the book and told me how much he really enjoyed it and liked it so much he bought a second copy and gave it to his son. But he said, Dr. Bowman thinks that you propose in this book will never, ever be done. I'm like, so why is that? He said, because they're too logical. They make too much sense. But are the kids able to comprehend well, again, that's what, said, now, you know. <laughs> that's what I'm saying from grades one through this. When I'm saying developing this curricula for conflict resolution, yeah. we start this in first grade. And of course, it builds to what's age appropriate all the way up through and including 12th grade. I guess the, um, the I don't know how good an analogy this is, but my parents paid for me to go through 12 years of Catholic school because they, they believed the school, that school system was better than the Chicago public league, the Chicago public school system. And for every year that we were in uh, Catholic school, we had to take theology. That was mandatory. Could not, must take it, must take theology. So that's why I came to that day. If we were teaching, training these kids how to resolve conflict without violence, without fussing, cussing, doing the fool, and thinking your way through things. Of course, it's make the curricula would have to be age appropriate and build and, and build all the way up to including, you know, your uh, last, you know, 11th and 12th years in school, that mm -hmm. we've got uh, a better product as far as once they finish this 12 years of school. Because now, because now our children can, they have critical thinking skills. Yes. Yeah. So your book is, it, it should be mandatory for the parents, especially. <laughs> it should be a, a Bible. <laughs> the criminal justice <laughs> Bible. Yeah, the criminal, yeah, right. Because, you know, like, well, the, uh, I'd say this, like chapter five in my book, how long have we been fighting this war on drugs? Oh, forever. Yeah. Since the 1800s. How we doing? <laughs> Good question, right? Hi. Yeah. So, uh, yes, that, that I have. Uh, I spoiler alert. I have to let you read that for yourself. But uh, I'm asking you this as a taxpaying citizen: How did this make you feel? Now, oh. uh, we had uh, this uh, war in Afghanistan. We had troops on the ground in Afghanistan for 20 years. Uh, 
And one of the things that found out, you know, being with other veterans and then uh, from a veteran, while well, I was at the Shelby County Division of Corrections, one of my clients was a Marine and he had been in Afghanistan. Uh, his story, the reason he's in jail, he was in jail for felony DUI. And Oh, no. Well, I mean, his story, did you, did you ever see the movie American Sniper? Oh, yes, yes. Okay, Absolutely. if you remember the event that caused the, the Bradley Cooper character to decide, okay, I have to get out of here, is when he had to kill that child with yes. the rocket launcher. Mm -hmm. Well, my client had to do that six times. Mm. Yeah, they, he was, they he don't was, talk about was, it. Yeah, he was Marine Corps, he's Marine Corps reconnaissance, and he had to kill a child with a rocket launcher six times and that pushed him into the drinking oh because he just didn't get he just didn't get what he needed to handle this because i can't imagine i can only i, I can't it's, imagine it's, it's unimaginable yeah. if i don't kill this child this child is about to kill 15 20 of my compatriots right but still it's a child it's a child. Right. Yeah, this will so, damage for, for for the rest of his life. He will carry this damage. It, yes, he will. And it drove him to drinking, which uh, ended up you know, getting arrested and convicted of DUI enough times that the, the last, uh, next time he got it, it made it a felony. Did he, did he offer him any help? No, not, not, like not, as much. Help. not as much as he needed. So... During our discussions, when I was talking, he talked about being in Afghanistan. So tax pain says, let me ask you how you feel about this. You do know that uh, the poppy fields in Afghanistan supply a whole lot of doggone heroin that's on the streets of the world. The poppy fields in Afghanistan supply a significant amount of the heroin on the streets of the world. But the other also supplied this. They uh, supply as much as, say, one billion. That's what it would be, one billion dollars for, for the terror organizations, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, et cetera, and so forth. Now, being former military, one of the things that age-old military strategy is to, is to destroy the supply train of the adversary. But instead, the, we had... United States Marines safeguarding and protecting the poppy fields in Afghanistan. Mm. To me, that means sorry. so we had Marines protecting a product that provides revenue for the bad guys to buy weapons to use against them. And so I termed that as offensively stupid. That should have been one of the one of the one of the first priorities upon putting boots on the ground in Afghanistan. A week later, those poppy fields should have been gone, eviscerated, yeah. done. But when we left, those poppy fields survived for presidents. They're still going. Unbelievable. I wonder how much, if any, of the revenue generated from those poppy fields maybe helped Hamas uh, get the weaponry it needed for its attack on Israel. Right. That's another story. We don't know. So we don't know. But I know, you know, for certain myself had mm -hmm. I had any input the, the after a week after the troops landed in Afghanistan, those poppy fields would have been history. But we're in a war on drugs and we're in a war on terror. So that's again uh American citizens. Mm -hmm. It uh it's time that uh, what we have to do is treat our people and notice that you, and we call them elected officials. I refer to them as elected employees. I like that. Because by definition, is that not what they are? Yes. Right. Who pays their salaries? We do. Okay. And then, you know, uh, the old song by B.B. King, he said, you know, I'm paying the cost to be the boss. Yes. 
But in the history of our country, we have never treated any of these people like employees. And so now, uh, over the course, that's why we have devolved to the kerfuffle that we're living uh, through right now. See, in that uh, in chapter six of this book uh, is entitled "Get Off the Sofa." In other words, you know, get get off, right. the, get involved. And I'm currently writing a book that's an extension of chapter six of this first book. Uh, the book I'm currently writing is going to be entitled "The Problem Is." We the people. Like that. We yeah, we have to start book. with us, right? Right. I'm in that book. I said I'm not going to focus on the uh the individuals in the office themselves. Matter of fact, I'm not going to even mention their names. We're just going to talk about the, the the circumstances and how we have allowed this to, you know, we we've allowed this to be this. This is yes. our fault. Because I'll ask this because this uh, um. Just a little tease. Uh, as a taxpaying citizen, in what way do we benefit from the uh, existence of the um, what do they call those people that go to Capitol Hill and uh, uh, and hey guys, we got a little money for you. If you do this, you do that for us. How do we benefit from them? What do they do for us? Right. So why do we tolerate it? 